Well, welcome everyone and happy Earth Week. So glad to have you here and have you joining us. Um, we're excited to have a great uh, chat this afternoon. And I'd like to kick us off by saying thank you to all of the um, partners that are participating with us today. So I'm gonna give some shout outs to Accesso and the Blue Ridge EV Club, um, the city of Boca Raton, Broward County, Florida, the city of Cape Canaveral, Florida, the city of Charlotte, North Carolina, Central Florida Clean Cities Coalition, Central Carolina Clean Fuels Coalition, the city of Coral Gables, um, Drive Electric, Florida. We've got um, also representing Drive Electric, Tennessee, the EV Club of the South, the Land of the Sky, Clean Vehicles Coalition, the city of Largo, Florida, the League of Women Voters of Palm Beach County, Plug in North Carolina, the Sierra Club of North Carolina, the South Florida Regional Planning Council, the Southeast Energy Efficiency Alliance, the Southern Alliance, a Southern Environmental Law Center, the Solar United Neighbors, the City of St. Petersburg, Florida, Triangle Clean Cities, Tennessee Clean Fuels, and the City of Winter Park Sustainability Program. So we've got a great uh, lineup for you. I'm going to introduce now one of our co-hosts, Kathy Harris. Um, Kathy is with the Eastern Clean Vehicles. She is a the Eastern Clean Vehicle and Fuels Advocate for the Natural Resources Defense Council. She works to reduce greenhouse emissions from the transportation sector, covering the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic regions. She advocates for policies that accelerate the electrification of light, medium, and heavy duty vehicles that are powered by clean, renewable energy. And prior to joining NRDC, she worked for the state of Delaware as a transportation planner and also served as the Delaware Clean Cities Coordinator. She holds a master's degree in marine policy from the University of Delaware. And I'm going to hand it over to Kathy to tell us more about NRDC. Thanks, Story. Um, can everyone hear me okay? All right, perfect. And thank you so much for having us today. We're really excited to be co-hosting this event with SACE. Um, so just a little bit of background on the Natural Resources Defense Council or NRDC. We were founded in 1970 and we're an international non-profit organization with over 1.3 million members and activists nationwide. And actually we've expanded to some international work as well. I'm on the clean vehicles and fuels team as part of the climate and clean energy program. And as Dory said, a little bit of my background, we we're working to just promote transportation electrification at the city, state, and federal levels to help reduce emissions. And my specific work, I work here on the East Coast and in the Southeast, and I'm really happy to be here today. Thank you, Kathy. And now I'd like to just introduce my own self. Um, I'm Dory Larson. I'm the Electric Vehicle Program um, Manager at the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy. And we also have Jen Rennix with us. She's our Senior Director of Policy and Communications. For those of you that do not know about the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, we are a regional membership organization that promotes responsible energy choices to ensure clean, safe, and healthy communities throughout the Southeast. And our um, work in electric transportation is done under our uh, umbrella called Electrify the South. So it's a program that leverages research, advocacy, and outreach to accelerate the equitable transition to clean energy-powered electric transportation throughout the Southeast. And today we're really, really excited um, to have um, with us Leilani Munter, who is an environmental activist, um, documentary filmmaker, biology graduate, and retired race car driver. So um, instead of reading about her, I'm going to show a video where she introduces herself. She also talks about a movie that she participated in called Racing for Extinction. So we'll show you a little clip about that. And then we're going to go into the recorded ride and drive videos. So I just wanted to mention that um, because we are still um, respecting COVID restrictions, um, we were filming in uh, my family filmed as a unit. So we're, that's why we aren't wearing masks and Leilani was filming hands-free. Um, and we both actually just got our vaccines yesterday. So we're excited to, um, to be promoting that public health as well. Um, so after the videos are over, we are going to go to a live question and answer where um, we will be 
answering your burning questions. So please be sure to put your questions in the chat as they come up so that we can answer them after the videos. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch us over to the, um, to the video and go from there. Give me just a second to switch it over. All right, we can all see the video coming on. For those of you that don't know who I am, I used to be a race car driver. I retired in February of 2019 um, after my last race at Daytona. But uh, before, before I retired, I, I sort of used my race car to talk about causes that I cared about. So clean energy, solar power, wind power. Um, I ran some documentaries on my car, um, a documentary film called The Cove that won the Academy Award in 2010. I ran a Cove car at Daytona. I ran a Blackfish car um, at Talladega. And you, you guys might have seen the documentary Blackfish on CNN. I've been vegan since um, 2011, both my husband and I. And, um, you know, three times a day, we all sit down to eat a meal and you can choose to leave meat and dairy off of your plate. And that's good for the animals and it's good for our planet and um, it's good for your own body. Also mention a film that I worked on um, called Racing Extinction. It's a documentary that's about the sixth mass extinction of species. What's happening now is unprecedented in its history. Why would we want to disrupt something that took billions of years to evolve? We need to fight it on all fronts. I think it's dawning on us now that this is the big one. OPS is a group I formed. It uses covert operations to expose harmed or dangerous species. We're doing our order here. One bottle cam. Right there's the lens. Two buttonhole cameras. Check one, two. Oh, that's good. Just about everything endangered in the world is for sale in China. Look at this stuff. Endangered, highly endangered, highly endangered. The more illegal it is, the more you have to go to the back rooms. We're definitely not welcome here. Oh, my God. There's things going on that are probably not safe to talk about. Climate is controlled by the ocean. And we're dumping so much carbon in the ocean, we can't take it anymore. Oh, we found this guy, Mr. Lee. He's culling and processing whale sharks. Nobody ever got the camera in there with them. We run into people with badges and uniforms. Like strip off all this stuff. Photo rule. Is it a fox in This world is absolutely insane. Wildlife trade is the second only to the drug market in the world. It's that lucrative. We need a getaway driver. And I knew one of the best. I love it. To create a heist, to hijack the world's attention. I think we want to put in an order for a card maybe. Excellent. We'll take one. No, this place, right? It's the five major extinctions in the history of the planet. This may be the sixth. When you're talking about losing all the nature, it's not a spectator sport. Everybody has to come at this somehow. The idea is to inspire people. The imagery is very powerful. If you can reach people, you can change them. We can make this happen. We need people to understand what's worth doing. People that have been in the business that don't even bother. But better to light one candle than curse the darkness. There's so many people who sit back and say we're screwed. But you know what? That one candle, maybe someone else will can find you. And I think that's where movements have started. You know, I was very aware of my carbon footprint when I was racing, and so um, in 2007, I made the commitment to adopt and protect an acre of rainforest for every race that I ran. And even though I only ended up running 60-something races in my career, um, I was able to adopt over 1,500 acres of rainforest. I did that with the Rainforest Trust, and they're an amazing group. Um, and it, you know, it just there was nothing I could do about the fuel that I had to burn in my race car, and that was my way for making up for that. And then, of course, 
beyond that, you know, I'm vegan and we have a 550 gallon rainwater collection tank in our backyard. We have a big veggie garden. Um, of course, we drive the electric car and have the solar power. Um, so I try and reduce my carbon footprint as much as I can. You know, nobody's perfect, um, but we can all try and do our part. I'm right now sitting in my Tesla Model S from 2013. This is a P85 Plus, and um, I bought the car in 2013, and it was delivered in September of 2013, and I've already driven over 96,000 miles on this car. To control the car, I have a app on my phone. So I click on the little Tesla app and it allows me to um, adjust controls, show me where charging is. Um, I can summon the car all with my, my phone. But there's also this key card so that in case the uh, phone goes in the pool or something, we can still get into our car and, and drive it. So um, to get into the car, pretty easy. Put your thumb on this portion here and then you just kind of grab it and pull out. I want to show you what the um, front trunk or the front looks like. So I'm going to hit controls and then I'm going to hit front and it's going to ask me, are you sure? Yes. And then it pops the trunk open so you can see what that looks like. Voila. There's no engine there. There is no engine there. <laughs> and then we'll walk around and see the back of the car. Again, I will hit the app trunk. Are you sure? Yes. And then you can see how big the trunk is. And then there's extra space there. So no spare tire. If you have a lot, you've got to call Tesla roadside service and they'll come get you a new tire. So one of the things that people love about electric vehicles is the instant torque. So there is a single speed transmission. So it just has this get up and go as soon as you put your foot on the accelerator. So we are going to test that out right now as soon as we get a clearing in the traffic. So this car accelerates faster than most gas cars? That is definitely true. I'm going to try it right now. All right, here we go. Wow. Isn't that great? Wow, that is quick. Yeah, so um, even, so all electric cars have that instant torque. Even uh, like my Nissan Leaf or the Chevy Bolt, they all have that real quick get up and go. Um, and you don't feel that jerky feeling um, when you're getting into- No, it's very here. smooth. Yeah, it's a real smooth, quiet ride. Out of curiosity, uh, because I knew I was going to be filming this video today, I charge the car all the way up. So normally for daily driving, you know, in my garage, I'm just really going to charge my car up to like half the battery, maybe two thirds of the battery at the most. Um, but you don't really need to fully charge your battery um, on a regular basis. I only do it when I'm going on road trips. Um, but I just wanted to see how much range I've lost in the last seven and a half years of driving. And the good news is I actually have retained over 90% of my range. Um, so that's, that's pretty impressive for seven and a half years of driving this car. So we want to show how this car has the um, semi-autonomous driving feature. And the way that it works is it's reading the, the cameras on the outside of the car are reading the lines of the street and also reading the vehicles in front of us. So when you have this little symbol on, you tap twice on the stock and then it will stop on its own. So it's slowing down on its own. So I'm not touching the brake. It's doing it. Um, it feels the car in front go, so it's going to come up to the stop sign and stop on its own. Do I need to tell it to go now that I'm, yes. when's my turn? Yes, so tap, hit the gas a little, and then it came off, so we'll go ahead and put it back on as soon as it reads the symbol. There we go. And it's going to match the speed limit 
but we're gonna turn it down just a little bit just by scrolling on this button here. And then it should be able to read the lines and stay within the lane. So I'm not touching the wheel, it's driving right now. Right. And we're gonna, we'll turn it down just a little bit more, drop the speed a little bit more, even though the speed limit's 30. And then watch how it takes the turn all by itself. Wow. Isn't that great? It's and then you can speed it up a little bit by hitting the button here again. So you don't even have to use the accelerator. You can just drive with it. And it knows there's a car up there. It, it does know there's a car up there. It knows the speed limit is 20. It, is, it knows what the speed limit is, and it's going to keep us in those lanes. We'll wow. turn it down just a little bit so we can go around the curb. And then there's a speed bump here, so we'll turn it down a little bit more. And there we go. Let's we'll see how it does on the bridge. So we turn the speed way down. So as the driver, anytime I want, I could take over. Absolutely. So to take back over, you just grab the steering wheel or put your foot on the brake or tap up on the stock. But either way, it can, all three will disengage the autopilot. Doing a pretty good job, huh? It does a very good job. Maybe a little better than me. <laughs> good. One of the first things that happened when I got my electric car delivered was, you know how people are so mean on social media, and uh, I had some trolls that were saying, you know, oh, congratulations, you've gone from uh, from a, a oil powered car to a coal powered car. Um, obviously, that's not true. The grid, um, you know, comes from many different power sources, and depending on where you are in the country. Um, it's going to be made up of all kinds of different things. Um, thankfully, I was able to, a few months after our electric car was delivered, we put up solar panels on our house. Um, so our house and our garage and, and cars are being powered by sunlight. And, you know, that's the ideal situation. Um, I know we're really lucky to, to be able to have solar. Um, and you know, it, it, it's it's the ideal situation, but it's it's not possible for everyone. Um, but just know that if you are plugging into the grid, um, you know, the grid is getting cleaner and cleaner all the time. We're installing lots of solar farms and wind farms across the country. Um, so the cool thing about your electric car is it's actually getting cleaner over time. If you're driving a gasoline powered car, you know, that's dirty energy and it's always going to be dirty energy and there's nothing you can do about that. It will be dirty forever. Your electric car is getting cleaner and cleaner every day. And the other thing about electricity to keep in mind is, is when you're charging your car with electricity, you're supporting a domestic energy source. So one of the cool things about um, powering an electric vehicle is that the energy that it comes from can be renewable. So we've added solar panels to the roof of our house, and those obviously panel those panels um, power our house. And then because we're plugging our car into the electricity uh, from our house, the solar is also powering the car. So it's really generating zero emissions. We're basically driving on sunshine. Even if you're living in a place like like West Virginia, where you know a, a large portion of the um, electric grid is being powered by fossil fuels, even there you're still actually going to have less emissions um, with an electric car than you would with a gas-powered car, um, and that is because electric cars are so much more energy efficient. So when you're using a gasoline powered car and you have an internal combustion engine, um, you are losing the vast majority of the energy that's stored in the fuel. You're losing it in the process. So you're actually only like 17 to 21% of the energy stored in the fuel um, is, is making it to push your wheels forward. Whereas in an electric motor, um, you're actually getting like 70s, in the high 70s to the, the 80s, um, percent of efficiency. Um, so it's just much more a much more efficient way 
of, of using, um, using energy. If you're, if you're thinking of getting an electric car is you're going to save a ton of money on fuel. Um, so one of the numbers that I saw that was a, you know, estimated calculation is that for every thousand miles that you drive in an electric car, um, you are, huh? I just asked my husband, <laughs> he's driving in three that way. Um, that's funny. Uh, sorry. Um, what was I saying? Oh, so for every thousand miles that you um, drive in an electric car, you're going to spend about $35 to charge up the battery. So that's really good. I mean, think about the, the lifetime of the car, how much fuel you're going to save. And in addition to saving money on fuel, um, you're also going to save a ton of money on maintenance. So, for example, you know, I've been driving this car for seven and a half years, and the only thing that I've had to spend money on out of pocket for maintenance of the car has been tires and new windshield wipers and windshield wiper fluid. And that's it. And, well, <laughs> one, one, one note, I might have, when I first got the car and I was so excited having so much uh, electric power under my foot. Um, I may have gotten a few speeding tickets back when I first got the car. I saw somewhere that um, the amount that they estimate that you can save in fuel and maintenance over the course of like 10 years, um, that the average is, is somewhere around $10,000. So consider that when you're, when you're shopping for an electric car, you have to consider the fact that um, you know, you, you're going to save a lot of money over the lifetime of the car. So you might pay a little bit more up front. Um, and you might not, you know, there's a ton of used electric cars out there now, now that EVs have been around for a while, you don't have to buy it new, you can get used ones. Um, so you have to, you have to take that in consideration when you're shopping. Now it's so easy to find chargers. There's chargers everywhere. Like I'm driving past, uh, we just passed a Whole Foods. There are uh, charge point chargers in there. Um, they have them at the airport here. Um, there's Tesla superchargers all over the place. I, you know, there's an electric grid all across the country. You can plug into all different kinds of chargers. You know, there's adapters so you can plug into different kinds. Um, and I've never had a problem in the, you know, 96,000 miles I've done in this Model S and we Okay, so we're going to talk about how you charge the car. So this is called level one charging or trickle charging. And it's basically an extension cord where one end goes into the car and the other is plugged into a regular outlet. A regular outlet, just like everybody has in their home. Right. So you can charge pretty pretty much anywhere. There's a 110 outlet. You can you can plug in and charge your car. So um, you just plug it into the wall and then come over to the charge port and plug it in. And then you add about five miles. So um, hold on, it's charging right now. Yep, it's charging. So you add about five miles per hour with this. So it's not a fast charge, but if you leave it overnight, you can add about 50 miles in the 10 hours that you're sleeping. So how much faster could you charge a car if you install your own charging station at your house? That's a great question. So we had an electrician um, add a 240 line. So this is basically the same type of outlet that you would plug your um, clothes dryer into. And then we just plug the device into that 240 line. And this um, gets us about 25 to 30 miles per hour added back on. So it's a lot faster to do the level two charging than it is to do um, the trickle charge. But it's just as simple. Um, you basically unhook the device. And um, because it's not a Tesla charging station, you have an adapter. So you literally just clip it on like that and then plug it into the car. Just like that. 
How expensive is it to install a level two charger? Another great question. So um, it, it costs about $150 to have the electrician um, drop the line. And then you can get a charging station for around $200 or you know, up to $1,000, depending on what you're looking for. They're just like those um, thermostats at home that you can adjust with your with your smartphone. You can charge them at different times of the day when it's cheaper, when the electricity is cheaper. So they connect to Wi-Fi. They can connect to Wi-Fi. Um, so there's lots of different um, bells and whistles you can get, but a basic one starts about $200. That same year that I started to get to all of my races using the electric car, um, my race team also became the first race team in history to power our pit box on pit road um, with solar power. So um, that was another really cool thing. We got to show the race fans, you know, they could see solar working. And the funny thing was, is there were some there were some other race teams that were interested in getting the, the solar system that we were using, not because they wanted to reduce their carbon footprint, but because they saw it as a competitive advantage. So normally race teams are using diesel generators to power all of the tools that they use on pit road and like, you know, the TV screens and all of that. And it's loud. And so they're kind of having to shout at the mechanics and the pit crew that are that are jumping over the wall to change our tires. And, you know, they wanted to switch simply because they felt like it was a competitive advantage to not have that loud noise right there on pit road that, that they could more clearly um, give directions to the pit crew. Um, so that's just another example of these tech solutions for the climate being actually you know, they're, you're not giving anything up. They're actually upgrades. Um, and I'm so happy and, and proud to have been an early adopter of electric cars. And I know a lot of the, the people tuning in today are probably already um, electric car owners. But for those of you who are not, I hope you will join us on Electric Avenue. I promise you it's a it's a it's a great place to be and um and once you go electric you will never go back to gasoline all right well thank you for uh sticking with us we hope that the video has piqued your interest and um so now we'd like to turn it over to kathy harris who's going to moderate our question and answer session for us and um, keep those questions coming. Yeah, thanks so much, Dory. And yeah, this chat has been excellent so far and I've seen a lot of really awesome questions come in. So we are going to try to answer as many as we can in the next half hour, but we'll also provide some additional resources in the chat and as a follow-up in case anyone else um, has additional information or would like to do, look into more um, resources and find out more additional information. Um, so let's kick off by, there was a question that popped up in the chat that asked about how does the life cycle cost of the vehicle compare to an efficient conventional vehicle? I know Leilani, you mentioned that the cost of fueling can be a little bit cheaper, but how, what does the life cycle footprint look like? Uh, somebody else want to take that one? I don't know all the numbers. Sure, I will. So um, if I'm going to share my screen again, um, can we see my slide? Not I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I can't see it. So shoot. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'll stop the share and just answer the question. Um, you need a concern. Uh, I'm sorry. The um, Consumer Reports did a great um, report <laughs> last October that compared the cost of several um, electric vehicles with their um, internal combustion engine counterparts that are similar to them. And they found that um, be, that the savings is between six and $10,000 on average of the lifetime of the vehicle to be driving an electric vehicle compared to an internal combustion engine. So um, it may be true that electric vehicles may have a higher um, 
upfront cost. But when you look at the fuel costs and you look at the maintenance costs over the life of the vehicle, um, EVs frequently come out ahead. So I think Jen was going to put that link in the chat for us. And is there anything, Jen, that I missed that you want to add to that? Uh, no, you are correct. Uh, but our questioner just had a clarification there. I'm not talking about economic savings. I'm talking about environmental footprint. Um, so I'll just... Okay, then I will answer that part of it too. Um, Union of Concerned Scientists have done research as well on this topic, and they have found that yes, there it is more carbon intensive to create the batteries um, to create an electric vehicle, but after about six months of driving electric, that um, washes out and it becomes um, more emission friendly and environmentally friendly to drive electric as well. And can I add, um, I actually work with a solar nonprofit that's called Empowered by Light, and we donate solar systems and battery systems in places in need. So, for example, in Puerto Rico, after Hurricane Maria hit, we put in a bunch of solar uh, systems and battery systems to get the fire stations online because about half of the emergency response um, fire stations were knocked offline. And, um, and we do this all over the world. And one of our most recent installations was a battery system that's actually, we're using a used EV battery that's from an electric bus in China. And what happens over time is the, the battery can't put out as much, um, as much electricity, um, as much power. Um, so the battery was no longer good enough to power this big heavy bus full of people, but it still has you know, the ability to discharge a lot of energy. It just can't do it in large amounts. So we actually took that used um, China bus uh, EV battery and we put it into a school that we had a solar system on in Zambia. And you know we've given this EV battery a second life and it works perfectly in a, in a solar microgrid situation where it's not having to dispense a large amount of energy in order to move this big heavy bus. It's just discharging you know, enough to turn on the lights and run the computers and that sort of thing. So even when an EV battery is used, and like I said in the video, you know, I've driven 96,000 miles in my Model S over the last seven and a half years, and I've only lost less than 10% of my range. So my battery is still going to be good for, for many, many years to come. You know, and maybe someday I will want my Model S to again have a bigger range and I might replace the battery, but that battery could then be used in a solar microgrid situation. And um, also keep in mind, there's a lot of brilliant people working on this. So um, J.D. Straubel, who's one of the co-founders of Tesla, he has a new company called Redwood Materials that's in Nevada. And what they're doing is they're taking used EV batteries and they're pulling out um, all of the, the um, raw materials from these lithium ion batteries and then once you pull all the raw materials out, you can reuse those to build new battery systems. So there's a lot of there's a lot of great solutions to to the problem of you know what happens to these EV batteries once it's not you know strong enough or robust enough to still work in a long range electric car or a bus. Thank you for that. That's a lot of really great information. And expanding off of that a little bit. Um, and I know that the report that Dory put in the chat will expand on this a little bit, but could you, could someone talk a little bit about what types of minerals we see being used in batteries now and where does currently most of that mining take place? Yes, so currently, um, and, and I will say also that the battery um, advancements are coming quickly um, and the battery composition has been changing as more research has been done. Um, but the um, most of the um, lithium currently comes from um, Chile. Um, the um, cobalt comes from the um, Republic of Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo. A lot of the um, um, 
Other minerals come from Australia. So um, there really are you know, quite a few different components that go into um, the electric vehicle and they come from different um, parts of the world. So actually the, so Chile does have the largest reserve of lithium, but actually, um, according to Forbes in 2019, 52, over 52% of all the lithium in global production is actually coming from Australia. Um, so Argentina also has um, lithium, the US I think is seventh. Um, uh, China has some really big lithium uh, production facilities. Um, but right now, I think it's actually Australia that's the leader, even though Chile has more than 50% of the reserve. So I'm sure we're going to see a lot more um, mining happening in Chile. And I just put a um, report in the chat as well from the Union of Concerned Scientists that kind of breaks down where all of the different um, resources come from and where they are um, not just being mined, but also being um, um, like purified. Great. Um, pivoting to the charging of the electric vehicle. Um, curious for folks' thoughts on how well built out the vehicle charging network is right now um, and the opportunities for expanding that network moving forward. So I'm going to try, I'm going to try to screen share again because I would like to be able to show a visual of um, some different resources and then um, talk about that a little bit. So here we go. Um, can everybody see that? Yes. All right. So um, there are two really great ways to find charging infrastructure, the Alternative Fuels Data Center, and that's the link there um, that Jen can put in the chat for us. That shows all of the electric um, charging stations across the country. You can filter it by level one charging, level two charging, DC fast charging, um, or by um, the type of, of infrastructure. So whether it be um, like Chatamo charging or Tesla charging. Another app that I have on my phone is called PlugShare. And I use that to find all of the different um, charging stations if I'm in a new area and I'm, and I'm wanting to, to figure out where that's at. And then Leilani, if you want to talk about like Tesla and how you can find the charging stations right in the car. Yeah, I mean, it's very convenient to be honest. I don't really use other chargers. I, I really just use the superchargers now because they're sort of everywhere. Um, back when I first got my Tesla in 2013, there were times that I definitely used pl the PlugShare app. And I actually had, the, the way that PlugShare works is you can share your own home chargers. So I had my Tesla charger that's in my garage on the map. So when Tesla owners would come through Charlotte, you know, they would be able to message me and say, you know, I'm driving from Canada to Florida. Can I stop and charge in your garage? And I did the same with other owners, but that's not really necessary now. Now Tesla has plenty of superchargers. There was something that was, you know, kind of sad about it because it was really fun actually to meet other owners. And, you know, when I was using other people's owner, uh, other people's chargers, I would always, you know, message them ahead of time and ask them, you know, what they would, if they like red or white wine, I'd bring them, you know, some sort of a gift to say thank you for letting me use their chargers. It was kind of fun. Um, and that's kind of been lost because now there's so many superchargers, nobody's going to need to go to anybody's house. But, you know, I did, I've done 96,000 miles in my Model S, um, another 33,000 miles we've driven in the Model 3 that we got in spring of 2018. And then I did another 10,000 miles um, in 006, which is the highly modified Tesla that I drove in Racing Extinction. And 5,000 of those miles was actually driving all the way from New York City back to San Francisco. And it wasn't a straight shot. I was zigzagging across the country the entire way um, doing some projection events with the car. And that was in 2015. And I never had a problem um, finding a charger. Usually I would use superchargers, but if I was kind of out in the boonies um, in a place where there weren't superchargers, I would usually go to campgrounds. Um, and oftentimes you can connect to RV. Um, the RV spots will have like 220 volt. 
Um, and then another thing to keep in mind is, you know, an example of um, this is when I was racing at Talladega Super Speedway, I was staying at a hotel that that was nowhere near a supercharger. The supercharger was all the way in Birmingham, but I was still a little bit of a distance from the hotel and I had to drive back and forth um, from the hotel to the racetrack for like three days qualifying and, um, and practice and the race and um, we didn't have a charger nearby, but we found a 110 volt, you know, it's just a slow charge. It was like three miles an hour, but because we were parked there overnight, you know, that was enough for me to be able to drive back and forth from the, the hotel to the racetrack. And then of course, when I needed to drive all the way home to Charlotte, North Carolina, where I live, then I made the effort to go to Birmingham and charge up the car fully at the superchargers. And the other great thing about the charging network and the way that it's changing is the superchargers are getting faster. Um, so like the Model 3, I've plugged in the Model 3 before and my Model S can't do this because it's so old, but I've seen my Model 3 charging at like over 600 miles an hour. Um, so it's really, really quick. You know, you, you plug in, you get out of the car, you might get a coffee or use the restroom and then you can, you know, take off again. And I used to do pre-COVID, I was doing a lot of road trips from Charlotte to Washington, D.C. And um, I think there were like six superchargers at this time between Charlotte and, and D.C. And I would only stop at a couple of them, you know, so I would just drive past like four of them because I didn't need to stop as often as the option was there. Um, so it's really convenient. I know everyone thinks when you switch to electric, you'll have this like range anxiety and everyone always asks, you know, oh, have you ever run out of battery and been stranded on the side of the road? And that just doesn't happen. You would have to completely ignore, you know, your gauges. You have a gauge just like you do for a gasoline car telling you how much gas you have left. I have something in the electric car that shows me how much charge I have left. You would have to completely ignore that. Um, and, and, you know, when you get desperate in a situation like I was when I was racing Talladega, you're always going to be able to find a 110 volt. Those are everywhere. I mean, the electric grid is everywhere. So it's, it's really not difficult. Wonderful. Um, and there was a question that came in also about the cost comparison for charging at home versus, um, the cost to charge out on the road for both fast charging and a regular charge. Um, I know that the majority, I think we've seen of charging happens at home at night, but uh, there is the, um, obviously when you're doing long-term trips or doing, um, your trip is longer than the range of your vehicle, the, there is a, a need for, um, for public charging, or if you don't have access to charging at home. So, um, was wondering if anyone has any thoughts on the comparison of price or how much it costs to, to refill at home. I am actually really lucky in that my Model S is so old. I bought it in 2013 that I, I have free supercharging for the rest of my life. So I don't actually have to pay for charging um, in the Model S. In the Model 3, it does charge a small amount, um, but it's, it's very minimal. And I just screen shared some costs that we've done analysis on. And if you're driving, um, a traditional gasoline car, it's about 12 cents per mile. And that's assuming the gas is 275 a gallon. As we know, like cost of gas, like constantly fluctuates and goes up and down. Um, to drive electric, it costs about three and a half cents per mile. So you'd be spending about $35 a month if you drive about a thousand miles per month, which is uh, what the average American drives. Um, if you are charging your EV from solar panels, from rooftop solar. Um, Dr. Jim Fenton um, from the Florida Solar Energy Center has done run the numbers and it's about a penny per mile. So that same trip would cost, um, you know, $120 in gas, $35 in electric or a penny if it was um, electric that was generated from your rooftop solar. So huge savings um, to fuel an electric vehicle. That's yeah, the amazing. Other thing that I'd love to mention is, you know, something to keep in mind when you're fueling up your car with electricity, you're fueling up with a domestic energy source, mm -hmm. right? It's not dependent on any countries overseas. It's not dependent on any geopolitical relations. Um, so you're supporting a domestic energy source 
And um, to me, that's that's a really important <laughs> point to make. I, I love not having to give any of my money to big oil. Um, so, and, and also the price of electricity is therefore a lot less volatile than oil prices. So that's another big plus about electric versus oil. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I know a big, um, headline that we've seen recently is the increasing um, market for electric vehicles. And so I was wondering if folks could talk about how many different options of electric vehicles are currently available on the market and then discuss, you know, um, the projections that we're seeing moving forward. I know GM has made some announcements about Volkswagen, uh, or sorry, GM has made announcements about going fully electric and so has Volkswagen as well. So would love to um, get some more information on some of the options that are currently available on the market and where we can kind of look over the next five or so years. Tori, do you wanna take that one? There's so many, I mean, I, I, I couldn't even name how many manufacturers and how many cars there are, but Dory, I know you have your notes. <laughs> sure, yeah, so there's over 67 models of EVs available. So that's plug-in hybrids and fully electrics. And um, like you mentioned, Kathy, all of the auto manufacturers have been making just huge announcements recently. So GM has said that they're intending on being electric by 2035. Um, we're looking at um, about 79 EV models coming up in the U.S. within the next five years. And the cool thing, too, is, is you know, my, my personal vehicle is a used Nissan Leaf. So it's a 2015 model, and the range was only 90 miles. But the range on almost all of the new vehicles that are coming out have at least 250-mile range. And, and the manufacturers realize that that's what the American consumers want is to have that longer range and have more flexibility in their vehicles. So that's, I think the cool thing is that, you know, the, as the cost to manufacture the batteries is decreasing, just like solar panels, the costs are coming down exponentially. It's making them more affordable to manufacture. Um, they are, bringing to market, you know, vehicles that, that folks want. There are gonna be, um, there's like 10 trucks that are coming out in the next three years from legacy car manufacturers like Ford, you know, they're producing an F-150 that should be available to purchase next year um, to the brand new startups like Rivian that are making their trucks and Tesla cyber trucks coming. So just so many new models coming to market. It's really exciting. Yeah, and I've also seen too that the used electric vehicle market is also becoming more robust as well. I know like Carvana, if you go on and search for used electric vehicles, there's tons and tons of options available as well. So for folks who are looking for a used vehicle, I think that there's also an increased opportunity for that too. Um, and I know you mentioned the Cybertruck and the F-150, which should be coming out soon, which is exciting, but also curious um, if you could talk a little bit about the importance of electrifying other forms of transportation, um, including school buses and maybe other large trucks that are driving through communities. Absolutely. So it's really vitally important that we electrify every aspect of our transportation sector. So not just passenger vehicles, um, you know, the bigger the vehicle, the greater the emissions. So um, medium and heavy duty vehicles, they make up a small segment, about 5% of the vehicles on the road, but they emit about 23% of transportation emissions. So tackling um, those um, vehicles like delivery trucks, long haul trucks, um, you know, especially because they're frequently using diesel fuel, they're emitting more nitrous oxide, um, and the federal emission standards are not as stringent as um, the standards for light duty vehicles. It's really important that we electrify our school buses, our transit buses. Um, and the cool thing is that a lot of people don't realize that we, we have electric options for all of those classes of trucks today that you can purchase. So cities are starting to buy electric garbage trucks and um, school districts are purchasing electric school buses and transit agencies are buying um, you know, transit buses. So it's, that's a definitely an important piece. Wonderful. Um, so I think we just have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, so we've talked a lot about the technology so far. And so would love to also chat a little bit about um, what 
government and local and state and federal government can do to help to support the growing EV market? Absolutely. So we um, have been doing a lot of work in the local government space. I um, specifically, uh, my work with the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, we have a, a local government EV toolkit that is a digital resource that Jen can put in the chat that's just this whole host of solutions that a local government can adopt to increase their fleet, to increase public charging in their communities, um, to look at making sure that that they're doing education events for, for their community members so that they understand the benefits of transitioning to electric. Um, so that's really important. Um, there are, you know, making sure that the federal government is involved now that they really are starting to take action. Um, it's really important that we pass standards to send market signals um, to make sure that the manufacturers are meeting their electrification goals and commitments. And the Biden administration um, has, has put out their plan for spending um, quite a bit of money on um, charging infrastructure and getting 500,000 charging stations across the country installed. Um, and then, you know, at the state level, that, that work is starting to happen, especially in the Southeast where we are. And that's really exciting to see bipartisan support for electric transportation because there's that recognition that there is, you know, a, a huge opportunity for economic growth in our region. Um, a lot of people don't realize 30% of the manufacturing of electric vehicles happens in the Southeast. So there's just, um, you know, in addition to the um, health and emissions benefits, there's a very real um, economic driver that's um, important to be looking at. And one thing I'll mention that I've noticed, um, a, a few of my friends have this problem where they live in an apartment building. And so they don't have the ability like I do with a garage to put in their own charger. Um, so I feel like that should be something that apartment complexes um, should maybe be required to do in the future is to offer um, electric charging stations, at least a couple for their, um, you know, for their tenants to share. And then another thing I'll mention is when we got our solar panels in here, um, I live in like a, a little community that's, um, that's like a green community where, um, you know, they put in or they advertise themselves as being uh, eco-friendly and that's how we were attracted to this neighborhood. Um, but then when we were looking to buy the house, you know, I told them I, we won't purchase the house unless we can put up solar panels and install a 550 gallon rainwater collection tank in the back. And they kind of blew us off for a long time. Um, and, you know, we were kind of in limbo, like, are we going to buy this house or not? And they wouldn't get back to me. Um, I finally sort of said, you know, I find it ironic that you're advertising yourself as a as a green community. Um, you know, literally their billboards were a, a rainforest tree frog sitting on a leaf saying how green they were, yet they wouldn't approve our solar panels. So I finally sort of said, you know, if you guys refuse our, our solar panel request, um, I do some writing and I'm I'm probably going to write about this. And then like two days later, we got the approval. But the funny thing is, and that was in like 2008 when we bought the house, when we finally were able to put up the solar panels a few years later, we started getting letters like saying, you don't have approval for these solar panels. And, you know, then we would of course send back the paperwork and say, no, you agreed to us putting up these solar panels and approved it before we even bought the house. And then they'd say, oh, sorry about that letter. That was a mistake. And then six months later, we would get the same letter. I think we got like four letters telling us that our solar panels, um, you know, were not approved. And I remember when the solar panels were going up, we had a bunch of people in this neighborhood asking um, for cards from the, the people who were installing it for us, the Renewable Energy Design Group of North Carolina is who we worked with. And yet nobody else in this neighborhood has put up solar panels. In fact, when we got our net meter uh, connected with our local utility, we were like the 12th house to get connected to a net meter, which for those of you that don't know a net meter, basically there's a meter that sits on the outside of our house. And during the day when we're producing solar power, 
it's recording how much solar I'm putting into the grid to power my house as well as my neighbor's homes. And then at night, the meter runs the other way and is keeping track of how much I'm pulling out at night because I'm obviously not producing solar at night. And then if there is any, um, if I'm producing more than I'm using, I actually get a credit with my, with my utility. Um, but I'm pretty convinced because I, I remember there being a lot of interest from this neighborhood and this would have been January, 2014 when our panels went in. Uh, there has not been a single other house in this neighborhood with panels go up. And based on the fact that I kept getting letters from the HOA makes me believe that they're not approving people putting the panels up. They were very concerned about what it looked like because my panels were gonna be facing the, the front of the house and the road. Um, so they wanted pictures of what it would look like. And I mean, I don't get it. I don't get why people think that solar panels, you know, are an eyesore. I think they're beautiful. Um, so that is another thing that I think needs to be made a law. It should be illegal for HOAs to stop people from putting up solar panels in their on their house if you want to produce your own power it should be your right to be able to invest and do that and i and i find it to just be ridiculous that hoas can tell you no we don't want you to put up solar because we think it's ugly it's crazy agreed to everything you just said Leilani. <laughs> thumbs up and i i did want to go back and make sure um that we did mention one of the policies that we really advocate for is called um ev make ready and that means that um, a local government is requiring that new construction um, have the ability to add EV infrastructure for especially for multi-unit dwellings um, late at a later date. So they may not need to install all of the charging stations right now while the market is still growing, but having the ability to do that makes it so much more affordable and also accessible. So a big chunk of our work at SACE is, is equity and making sure that everyone is included in um, this EV revolution. And so making sure that affordable housing has access to be able to charge their vehicles, really, really important. So thanks for mentioning that. Yes, absolutely. And I will just say too that at NRDC, one of the things that we work with is utilities as well to help support the build out of the infrastructure and helping with that make ready portion. And then also ensuring that um, the rates are designed well to help to shift charging to periods of time where there might be excess electricity on the grid. Um, so I think with that, we are at two o'clock. And I will hand it back or thank Leilani and Dory for the great Q&A. And I will hand it back over to Sace to wrap us up. Well, thank you again to all of our participants for, for joining us this Earth Week and being with us. Um, and thank you to all of the um, our partners that helped to share the event. Thank you so much to NRDC, our co-host, and to Leilani Munter for just being such fantastic advocates for electric transportation. Uh, I've got up on the screen, I think you guys can see uh, Electrify the South, our, um, you know, our social media handles. So we would love for you to stay connected with us. And I wanted to share NRDC's um, social media handles. So please make sure to get connected with them and join their efforts. And also sharing Leilani's um, website and social media. So please continue to follow her and all of the fantastic advocacy that she's doing and just tell, you know, reminding everybody to, to please be good to mother nature and please be good to each other. And until we meet again, take care.